Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum. And this program is brought to you uh, by the Bernard Osher Foundation, which supports the, the, many of the programs here at the Commonwealth Club. Um, and in addition, I'd like the audience to know that you can ask questions of uh, Paul Ehrlich, our speaker, um, by just putting them into the YouTube chat room. So today we have Paul Ehrlich. Um, those of you who are my, my age or so, um, know the, him from the book, The Population Bomb, or from watching him on Johnny Carson. Um, a lot of us uh, used to, you know, it, it, it's interesting to find out that you're only a little bit older than I am, <laughs> because, because you were an adult when I was watching you. <laughs> I, 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 I really hate it when grownups come to me and said, I, you know, I read your book in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't in kindergarten. <laughs> uh, uh, but. But so uh, Paul is here and uh, has a new book about his life and, and uh, about the politics and science, the whole element of what he got involved in and how he got involved in it. And I'm sure that the readers and, and listeners uh, of the Commonwealth Club work that we do here will be happy to find out that uh, Paul became famous after a lecture at the Commonwealth Club in 1966. Uh, it was broadcast on the radio, which we're still doing. Um, and, uh, and then you got asked to do all kinds of other lectures. Already known, already known, but it was one of the pushes along your way, right? It was the most important thing from my point of view because I had no idea that, the broadcast, that it would be broadcast. Mm -hmm. And suddenly after the broadcast, I got all these requests mm -hmm. and I had been lecturing to 30 or so students at the Stanford class on evolution and all of a sudden, I was asked to talk to groups where there'd be 5,000 people or 7,000 people or something. And a born loudmouth, after all, you know, <laughs> if you get your chance to blow it up like that. And then, of course, when Johnny came along and it went up to 15 million, uh, that, that's loudmouth heaven. So you, you, you have an experience back in the 60s of exactly what happens to some people on, on YouTube today where they... They, they do one thing and then, you know, even if they play with their cat or whatever, and the next thing you know, five million people have watched them. Um, yeah. An, an overnight sensation. It's really quite a strange world we live in uh, digitally, as you mentioned in your book about how different this is and how are we going to adjust to it. One of the many questions you've been asking your whole life. So um, why don't we talk a little bit about your, you know, this is about your life. Uh, we'll talk about your ideas. They're an indispensable part of your life. But let's uh, talk a little bit about your life. Let's go back to your childhood and and uh, you have some great stories about your, your mother and how your mother helped you out and, <laughs> and, and your father's approach to it. <laughs> well, one of the things about my mother, who died 15 years ago, roughly almost 100, um, is that she was uh, a, an unusual woman. Born in 1907, she wouldn't marry my father until she finished her college years, which was very unusual for a woman then. She first went to Bryn Mawr, then could not afford the tuition there. The, and so uh, she switched to the University of Pennsylvania, where I eventually went. But she had a, a very modern view and uh, was very determined to answer questions accurately, which uh, led to an interesting sex education for me, among other things. <laughs> Do I want to, you want me to tell that story? Well, you, you can if you want to, but I, uh, you know, that's the hardest thing for people to answer honestly uh, is, is questions from their children about sex. So, Well, um, my mother, my father was a businessman. Uh, he was always honest with me, but it, it was my mother's job to educate me. And she gave me what we would consider today a perfectly modern description of human reproduction. Mm -hmm. uh, and we went through the whole thing, finally got after maybe five sessions to the penis and the vagina story. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went away from that. And what I was thinking was, holy smokes, it must be uncomfortable in the bathtub. 
<laughs> and because the only thing I'd ever seen come out of a penis was urine. And I figured it must be hellish messy. And so they must use the bathtub. I thought on that for a while. And How I old came are you? back. I came back to my mother and I said, isn't it terribly uncomfortable? And she said, what are you talking about? And I told her. And she says, no, 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 it's not urine. It's a very special fluid. And I said, that quite naturally being six or so, yeah. um, well, how does Pop know when it's going to be the special fluid? <laughs> and she said, well, that's your father's job to explain. And she turned me over to him. And my father, I think every male in the place will admit, gave me a perfectly accurate description. She said, you just know. <laughs> you just know. And so at six you years, just know. At six years so old, that was the end of my sex education. Yeah. But you, you, and, and now you, you went into biology and, and you know, the, your, your studies about butterflies are fascinating to how much you, time you've spent on that. That's where, where you put your first focus. Um, but you did make the joke that, that your, your father was wondering about you because you got interested in butterflies in, in high school. Um, yeah, no, he, he was very much worried uh, that I was gay. And in those days, for a father, that would have been a very substantial worry, uh, not an unreasonable worry, because the treatment of gay people then, bad as it is now, mm -hmm. uh, was much worse. Uh, but, uh, of course... Uh, in those days, being a butterfly collector was supposed to go along with being uh, gay. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was really worried about two things. One is, was I gay? And two was, if I collect butterflies, will I ever be able to make a living? Yeah. And uh, when I was uh, just early and uh, halfway through college, I went to the Arctic uh, for a summer uh, working for the Canadian Defense Research Board through my butterfly connections and came home with all my expenses paid for three months and $1,000 to boot. It doesn't sound like much today, but $1,000 a lot of in those days. I mean, my first salary at Stanford some years after that was $5,000 for a year. So it was a lot of money. And then, as you can see, if you buy my book and look at the pictures, I ran into the most beautiful woman and smartest woman in the state of Kansas when I was a graduate student and brought her home. And that killed my father's idea that I might be gay uh, because he was a, uh, uh, he liked beautiful women too. Mm -hmm. Something you inherited. Yeah, that's right. It's two things in my genes, uh, liking women better than men and also being a collector. I like to collect things. Well, um, it's, it's amazing your story about how you, how you took that butterfly collection and turned it into this huge project, which you've, you've done in so many different ways uh, politically, besides your science. But one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was um, being a famous author on a topic that's, that's controversial, uh, sometimes is looked down on by other scientists. And you, you talk about how you've, you've been able to keep your scientific rigor and your scientific reputation and then add to that at the same time. You to, it, I, I think it'd be great for you to explain how you did it because there's a lot of scientists out there who would like to know how to do that. Well, um, it's getting to be more common by actual effort by groups of scientists of which I've been a member. Uh, my colleague Peter Raven has been a member and so on uh, of making it very clear that we want the perks in science not to just go to people who are the shoemakers who stick to their last, mm -hmm. who get more and more narrow and don't believe that uh, scientists should give opinions but only tell the facts. Uh, we could have a long discussion of what facts are, but in any case, uh, Steve Schneider, who's now sadly gone, Peter Raven and myself, uh, all made a point of saying that you don't give up your right to free speech just because you're a scientist. You know, somebody will say, I get, frequently get something like this. How in the hell can you say something about climate change mm -hmm. uh, because you work on butterflies? Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is, uh, A, I've spent maybe 16 hours a week for the last 40 years looking at issues around climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my best friends are the best scientists in the world. 
knowing about it, Steve Schneider being an example, John Holdren, who was uh, the president's science advisor during the Clinton and the Obama administrations, and so on. We talk about it all the time. Uh, if you put the effort into learning about something, then it's a reasonable thing to use that knowledge if you feel there are policy issues you should speak out on. That goes if you're a garbage collector. Mm -hmm. If you spend your life studying something and then you find out that the city you're working for is poisoning people in some way by how they handle the garbage, mm -hmm. you should speak out on it. If you know something that other people don't, um, you have a right to speak on it and you should always say where your knowledge comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, we came up, I'll give you just a little sermon. We came up with a principle that I sometimes, f I try to follow as best as I can. On a scientific controversial issue, the first thing you say is what the consensus of the scientific community is. Doesn't have to be correct, mm -hmm. uh, but you say, this is what most scientists think. Then if you differ from it, you should say, but I differ from it. And as I have in sometimes in the past said, mm -hmm. I don't believe that. I think it goes a different direction. And you can tell the public about why you think the scientific consensus is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and you make it very clear to the public uh, what your opinion is, what it's based on, and what most scientists think, and let the public decide for itself. And one of the things you've got today uh, is uh, very good access to books mm -hmm. uh, and to literature. Unfortunately, you also have access to sites on the web that are pure BS. <laughs> but one of the things that kids should be taught in school is how to sort the wheat from the chaff. Mm -hmm. And people have got to learn to think for themselves and educate themselves. Yeah, the, 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 the sermon. Yeah, no, no, that's great. The, the, uh, your attitude about this and your other scientists that you, you talk about uh, reminded me of actors who say the same thing, you know, but I also still have a right. I mean, they said, you're just an actor. You can't say anything. Um, but, yeah. you know, and, and no, abso absolutely. You, politicians. But you should be yeah. clear <laughs> on how you know what you're what how you think, you know, yeah. what you're talking about. Right. Well, I mean, we we have, you know, 350 million viewpoints in our in our country. And uh, in order to get along, I mean, we're trying to 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 try to have something in common that we can talk about. Some people think well, there's nothing in common, you know, but, but the world, the world, if it's objective at all, there's something that we all share. And the, the, the more viewpoints we have on it, we should get to a closer idea about what's actually happening. One thing you can check uh, as a, uh, so I hate to use the term amateur, but a non-scientist mm -hmm. is look at the acknowledgments in scientific books and papers. For instance, basically none of the points of view that Anne and I have expressed over the years have not been reviewed by first-rate scientists, mm -hmm. the best in the area. For instance, the population bomb mm -hmm. was read by Don Kennedy. A lot of people listening to this program doubtless knew Don. Mm -hmm. He was president of Stanford. He was the editor of Science, member of the National Academy, uh, head of the Food and Drug Administration. He read the population bomb. Peter Raven read the population bomb, and a list of maybe 25 mm -hmm. other people are listed in the book. So. I wasn't presented one one nutcase's view mm -hmm. of population. I was presenting a view that had been approved by a bunch of people who knew about it. Right. And I'd say, you know, besides Anne and your, your daughter and your, your family and everything, I think one of the things that makes your life so fascinating is you knew so many famous scientists and, and became friends, and then you get, get to share ideas with them. I mean, that for anybody who likes to write and, and, and likes ideas, that's an ideal life. No, we, uh, I used to purposely invite uh, the top taxonomist of the last century, Ernst Meyer, mm -hmm. to Stanford to give seminars um, because we had some minor differences in taxonomy. And I used to like to argue about it, as did he, mm -hmm. in front of graduate students. Um, <laughs> one time when I was an assistant professor, Ernst was lecturing to our graduate students and said that he always tells graduate students if they disagree with him uh, whether or not um, uh, to just tell them that they disagree. And one of my graduate students actually became one of my best graduate students ever, 
uh, at that point said to him, does that apply to graduate students in other departments as well? <laughs> and the, the chairman of our department said, you got to get rid of him. <laughs> Ernst thought it was funny. And shortly after that, I was feeding him cocktails in our living room. Mm -hmm. We got into another argument and the um, fake um, fancy chair that we had bought, it was, I think, made in Poland, but made to look like it was made in Sweden, mm -hmm. disintegrated under him and deposited him on the floor uh, in a, soaked with wine, uh, dropping the potato chips. Uh, <laughs> and he still remained a friend. I saw him last when he was a little over 90 and drove into Harvard to continue the argument with me. <laughs> well, Let's uh, go back to the butterflies now, because uh, you and, and, and how you, you, you moved out to Kansas. Let's let's do the how did I get to Kansas you, you know, uh, part of the story, because well, that was interesting. I, uh, I was working with butterflies because of the Lepidoptera Society. I had gotten contacts. I, it was a brand new society. I think I'm one of two still charter members still alive. Mm -hmm. um, and they got me in uh, to uh, go to the American Museum, and I met the curator of butterflies, and he introduced me to all sorts of stuff. And I, I for instance, I met um, Nabokov. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, I had an incident with Nabokov because uh, he and I discussed butterflies, and when I became a graduate student, he published Lolita. Mm -hmm. And the University of Kansas, where I was a graduate student, uh, had reprint cards that you mailed to somebody if you saw a paper by them you liked. And it said, Dear Professor Blank, and you filled it in. I'd very much like a copy of your blank. And then it was signed <laughs> at the University of Kansas. And I sent him a reprint card for Lolita, and he never spoke to me again. <laughs> but I got there. Uh, <laughs> I could have gone to medical school, not because I had a good record as an undergraduate, but because my father's best friend uh, was the chief proctologist at uh, Jeff Med. Mm -hmm. And when all my undergraduate friends were applying to medical school, virtually all male in those days, uh, Uncle Ben called me up and said, um, you know, Paul, if you'd like to go to medical school, uh, we would be very happy to have you at Jeff Med. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, thanks, Uncle Ben. I'm going to go to Kansas to work with Charles Mitchner. I want to do something different. And he said, fine. I just wanted you to know you'd be welcome. And uh, I think that was a big political mistake, actually, in my career. Because mm -hmm. uh, when you think about uh, the Trumpites in Congress and so on, having some knowledge of proctology would be very helpful in dealing with it. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I can't disagree with that. <laughs> um, um, you just always call your uncle in and help. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about your story, which I think is one of the changes, it, you, you mentioned a lot about population, obviously, um, that the population uh, when you were born and then when you were writing about the population bomb, it had already, it had already almost doubled. And of course, it's, almost, it's, it's doubled again since then. Um, so, so this huge increase in population, I think, is part of the, one of the reasons that what you experience doesn't happen anymore, which is that people just picked you out, and it didn't matter what your grades were. You kept mentioning your grades weren't fantastic, but people picked you out and just said, this is a talented young man. I'm going I'm to give him this, or I'm going to give him that. Um, and I think a lot of companies work that way. People would pick out people that they thought would work, and I'll, I'll, I'll bet you did your grad students the same way. But I think now, with so many people involved in such big organizations, the people that do the choosing are not near the top. They're part of the HR department, and they, they want to rely upon those papers. So if something goes wrong, they can say, well, you look good on paper. Well, I think there's a general problem in the world. I have a lot of general problems in yeah. the world today, and there are, of course, very serious existential threats. But what I see uh, in my own experience more than anything else is we're turning in more into administrative organizations where uh, people make rules uh, and then the people who administrate the rules 
are not necessarily the sharpest knives in the drawer. Mm -hmm. And so you get administrative decisions that are just insane. Um, and people, I, I have, I'm wearing uh, hearing aids that I got on the web mm -hmm. and uh, people I hope can appreciate that what I consider about the most miraculous is when I have a problem with them, I call a phone number. And what happens is a human being answers. That's semi-miraculous on its own. And then the human being, now four or five times in a row, has given me a solution to the problem that has worked. Mm -hmm. And those of you who have experience fooling around with websites know the odds are usually higher that you'll end up back on the street <laughs> and having to dial in again uh, and talk to the person in Bangladesh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so... That's one of the problems. Another problem, of course, that really distresses me uh, is we've worked very hard in our department and my discipline and so on uh, to end the, as far as possible the gender prejudice, which uh, of course is now once again getting worse. The Republican war on women, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, is winning. But um, I'm even, even more distressed in some ways by the racial situation because we worked so hard for years and made progress up through about Reagan um, in the racial situation in the United States. And again, it's turned around and gone in the wrong direction. And I believe anybody who cares about the future of humanity realizes that we can't waste the brains of women, people of different colors, people of different uh, religious ideas and so on. Uh, we're going to have to all get together and solve the existential problems. And sadly, there's not much of a sign of it. Yeah, I think um, one of the advantages of competition across the, the, the world is that the countries that do not use their female resources or their minority resources, whatever it is in that country, are at a serious disadvantage to the ones that do. And so there's at least some pressure left. On the other hand, politics sometimes works in exactly the opposite direction. Yeah, so. well, we're, we are originally a small group animal. In other words, mm -hmm. people forget, tend to forget that we have uh, a history of hundreds of thousands of years as hunter-gatherers. The history didn't start uh, with George Washington in the United States or Aristotle and so on. It started a very long time ago, and for almost all of our evolution, our genetic evolution and our cultural evolution, uh, we're used to dealing with somewhere between 30, 40 to maybe 150 people almost all the time. So everything about us makes us small group animals. We were, for example, uh, we did never develop the ability to do long-term planning because for the vast majority, of those, say, 300,000 years, there was not a damn thing we could do about the long term. Mm -hmm. Our planning, our reactions, our nervous systems were all designed for the short term. Now the big problems are long term. Mm -hmm. The accumulation of nuclear weapons, the uh, disruption of our climate, and so on. So as a small group animal, uh, we're really bad at dealing with the environment, and we're pretty bad at dealing with each other. In other words, we're a small group animal trying to live in groups of billions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, people take advantage of that. You get dictatorships. And we were seeing a lesson now on the United States mm -hmm. of how, I mean, you have uh, sad parallels between how the Nazi party, the NDSAP in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, got power. And now in the United States, you're seeing how the American Nazi party, the GOP, Mm -hmm. is getting power and uh you know people ought to learn history and learn the problems of trying to deal as a small group animal with gigantic groups with existential problems because bringing down civilization is in process mm -hmm. and uh i don't know how long it's going to last i hope it's going to last long enough for my great grandchildren who thrilled me for the last week by visiting mm -hmm. uh, but i i'm not totally optimistic so let's, uh, we'll get, I want to get back to the nuclear weapons in a little while, but I, I want you to show up in Kansas because you found as a liberal from, from uh, where you grew up in, 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 uh, on the East Coast, right? Um, 
that, that it was a, a totally different racial situation than you had been used to. And it, it wasn't the well, South, it was Kansas, so. No, no, my first experience actually uh, with segregation came when I joined a traveling camp, thanks to my parents, when I was 15 in St. Louis. And I flew out there in a DC-3 and we landed at Lexington, Frankfurt, and I had to go to the bathroom. Mm. And I went in to the bath, to the tower, the building, and there was a sign, whites and Negroes. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I'd come across that. But of course, in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, everything was segregated, except the university's um, student union. Mm -hmm. And a, uh, a, a black scientist joined the lab of one of my close friends, came out on a, arrived on a Friday and could not, they let him in the hotel, but he couldn't get any food until Monday, except by buying candy bars. Mm -hmm. And that led us to start. I mean, I, I was just too unconscious mm -hmm. of the problems of segregation until that happened. It brought it right home. Uh, and we started doing uh, profitless lunch days for the local restaurants and eventually mm -hmm. managed by, by moving in with move groups of black and white students. Mm -hmm. um, they would not serve us, but they would serve, they would not make any money right. on the weekends. And we eventually managed to break that down, although it was after Ann and I left Kansas in the 60s before they desegregated the swimming pool. Uh, there's this, mm -hmm. one of the problems or advantages of living a long time is I can imagine what the world was like way back then before there were cell phones, before there were um, computers anywhere, really, mm -hmm. um, before there was uh, uh, tape recorders, for instance, no Walkmans, uh, no Xerox machines. Mm -hmm. When I wanted to make a copy of a paper, I had to put fluids into a couple of things on a machine, run the machine, draw, get the thing out like it was a um, print, and then carefully when it was dry, store it in a folder, otherwise it would just turn black. Uh, it was a very different world. We could the always, thing, I was very much always have full employment if we just eliminated copying machines and made everybody scribe again, you know, <laughs> it's right. like you can always get it that way. That's not the right way to do it, but you can always achieve it if, you, if that's what you want to do. Uh, I really love it if you told the story about Wilt Chamberlain in Kansas because it, it shows how the politics of the president of the university handled the situation with the, with the local um, yeah. you know, film, yeah, yeah, film operator, was... film uh, uh, theaters. But I met, it also, I met it also showed once in a very good, I'm sorry, it showed in a very good example, really how strong the effect was of letting in the best African-American athletes into the different sports. People don't realize why and how powerful that was as a force. So tell the Wilt story. I, I, yeah, I almost, I always yeah. remember Wilt because in those days, I'm down to about 5'11 now as mm -hmm. you're, you know, you get older, you're, uh, the pads between your vertebrae uh, get thinner and you get shorter. So what I was about 6'2", mm -hmm. and the first time I ran into Wilt, we were talking in a bar and he got off, uh, I was sitting next to him in the bar. I don't even remember why I was sitting next to him in the bar. Um, but we, after we talked, he got up and he's towered above me in a way no human being had ever towered above me at 6'2 mm -hmm. before. But when he, they tried to recruit him to uh, play for KU, uh, they gave his father a job. Um, but he said he wouldn't play for KU. He didn't care about the restaurants, but he would not sit in the um, a balcony in the theater because the theaters were segregated. Uh, Non-whites had to sit in the balcony. And he said, not for him. If he wanted them to pay, they had to be able to sit in the uh, sit wherever he wanted in the theater. And the uh, president, the, excuse me, the provost of Kansas University then, um, I'm, I'm having a senior moment on his name, but it'll probably come back to me. Mm -hmm. But he held a meeting of the theater owners, uh, three or four of them, uh, Steve Murphy. His name was Murphy. Mm -hmm. He later became chancellor of UCLA. But Murphy had the meeting of the, of the uh, 
theater owners, one of whom was Fog Allen, who was the football coach. <laughs> and he was dying to get Wilt to come play ball for Kansas. And, uh, but they all said, sorry, that uh, they couldn't desegregate because they'd lose all their white customers. No white customers would come if they had desegregated. And so it was Frank Murphy. Frank said, uh, okay, I'm just going to have to show free first run movies on campus every Saturday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. <laughs> Instant desegregation. <laughs> Took them one nanosecond to decide that they could live with it. And of course, nobody refused to go. Wilt went, you know, where he wanted to, to the movies. Uh, but it just shows you uh, how easily some things are done. The restaurants were a tougher deal, but we used to go. I, I, either I or Ralph Barr, who was the faculty member of the lab that we were, we were doing this through, would go talk to a restaurant owner uh, before um, uh, we would have one of those sit-ins. We thought it was only fair mm -hmm. to let them know what we were going to do. And almost uniformly, when I said to them, look, you know, we want to get Will. What would you do if Will came in for lunch? Mm -hmm. And all but one said, oh, my God, that would be so embarrassing, because by that time, uh, Wilt was already a hero mm -hmm. in Kansas. And they said, oh, my God, I don't know what I'd do. I'd be so embarrassed. I don't know what I'd do. One guy was at least cons consistent. He said, using the N-word, mm -hmm. he's an N, isn't he? I'd throw him out of here on his butt just like anybody else. So you got to give some people credit for uh, consistency. We also got consistent death threats, but mm -hmm. um, the people who give death threats generally don't carry them out. They're mm -hmm. just cowards yeah yeah i think it's a great story and i mean maybe with a little bit more financial incentives we could have moved things along a little faster <laughs> well it did work the the yeah. sit-ins did work although interestingly they weren't covered in the um the ku newspaper mm -hmm. and um i actually a, a colleague of mine uh, who's a historian I uh, tried to dig up with the um, the um, the librarian of the University of Kansas records on what had happened because I didn't keep any notes. Mm -hmm. Ralph Barr was my colleague, died. Everybody like Michener and so on who were still alive at the time we were looking at it remembered it, but no, there's no record. And in fact, there was a lot of that kind of sit-in um, back desegregation in the Middle West at that time. Mm -hmm. And there, we found one or two articles about, among other things, how it was ignored by the press. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was a big deal in the South, but it wasn't in the Middle West. And I think most people weren't aware uh, mm -hmm. of the desegregation in the Midwest the way they were in the South. What year was it you were in college? My, my calculation it was in the 50s, 50s, right? Mid 50s. Mid 50s. So in the yeah. mid 50s, it was long before the famous uh, sit ins uh, that in, in the South that eventually started to crack. They, yeah, I eventually, mean, they, they, well, they came before. a little later, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, that was another interesting part that people are not, not that aware that that was uh, something that students and other people were doing to push. Uh, lots of things happened in small ways before the big things happened that actually cracked the uh, cracked it open a little bit but we still had shockley at stanford and things yeah, yeah, like yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> so Wait. and and now how did you you got pulled from ku to stanford right or did you uh, yeah well i i was a graduate student at ku right and then when i uh got out i became a postdoc in chicago Ann and i went to chicago uh, with Joe Kamen, and then I applied for the job at Kansas and got it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm one of the rare academics who's only had uh, basically one faculty job for his entire career. Mm -hmm. I had a wonderful, Stanford gave me a wonderful environment, no salary to speak of, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I really, they never asked me to stop doing anything or to do anything. Uh, I was I had my life's ambition was to become 
a tenured professor at a major university and KU at Stanford supplied that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm eternally grateful to it, even though like with any big organization, there are things that Stanford does and has done that I think are just silly. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, basically they let me alone and undoubtedly thought some of the things I did were basically just silly too. <laughs> Well, you might be able to thank them for the low salary because it made, made you into a writer. You know, you said That's you had to supplement true. your income, right? Well, it's, what, it's <laughs> where marrying the most beautiful girl in Kansas, who also, you know, we, are, we got together originally over a discussion of um, the British evacuation of Dunkirk. Mm. Um, so I found out that the best looking girl I'd ever seen also was highly knowledgeable about one of my great interests, mm. the Second World War, also had worked for my major professor and was a talented dissector of organisms and worker, uh, knew an awful lot about biology. So it was uh, uh, quite a natural thing that Kansas uh, got me uh, headed for Chicago and then to, out to, to Stanford um, and Stanford did very well by her as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at least half of everything I've accomplished in my life, whether it's good or bad, you can blame on Anne. Uh, <laughs> she's the introvert and I'm the extrovert. She's the brains and I'm the mouth. And it's worked very well for us. <laughs> well, you, you one, one of your stories, which I thought was great because it puts the two issues together of race and, and your scientific research, was how you took on taxonomy uh, and, and this subspecies idea and how to decide what is a subspecies and what is a species. Why don't you tell me? Because that that's a, was a, a scientific dispute that had big uh, impact in the way people think about it. It was a scientific things. dispute, yeah, that I got into um, the... The original, uh, this is what Ernst Meyer and I argued about. Um, he wanted to uh, think of the species, that is the different kinds of organisms as uh, basically defined by whether or not uh, one from one species could actually reproduce with the other, with another. So that um, to give an actual example, the polar bears and brown bears can mate in captiv captivity mm -hmm. and produce hybrids. And the issue was, are they then separate species or are they the same mm -hmm. species? And uh, we argued over technical issues over that for a long time. But one of my, uh, my major professor and my second major professor um, began to examine the whole basis of taxonomy how you figure those things out. And it came from an argument in a seminar where Michener, my major professor, Bob Sokol, who was my second major professor, and three graduate students, including me, were there. And Sokol was the person who brought statistics into biology. And he said, what you guys are doing arguing about phylogenies is just BS. What you're really doing is just <laughs> comparing uh, different kinds of organisms uh, by their similarity. So if they're very similar, you say they're the same species. If they're similar but somewhat different, then they belong to the same genus. Uh, if they're even more different, then they may belong to different subfamilies or families and so on. He says, you're just doing similarity comparisons, he says. And with a product moment correlation coefficient, you could do the same thing on a computer and get the same answer. It would be repeatable. And Michener, being fully as open-minded as I was in those days, said, that's nonsense. And I said, bullshit. <laughs> and we got into a long series of arguments, about three meetings of the seminar. And finally, Michener and Sokol said, OK, we're going to have to test it. McSmith Sokol held his position that he could do it with numbers. So Michener was then the world's expert on the taxonomy of bees. And he got one of his students, I don't remember the numbers now, but about 60 different bee species that Michener considered uh, had a certain relationships and belonged to certain genera. Um, and 
measured about 60 characteristics on each species and brought the sets of numbers to, um, to Sokol. And Sokol, who did not know a bee from a beaver, mm -hmm. took them away, did product moment correlation coefficients, found a way of evaluating how the coefficients worked, and came back with a tree-like diagram that beautifully reproduced what Michener had decided on the basis of the old taxonomy. Mm -hmm. And you knew exactly how he did it. And that was the start of the numeric, numerical taxonomy revolution, mm -hmm. uh, which turned taxonomy from something where if you didn't like a person's work, you just judged it on the basis of the person, mm -hmm. not the work. Mm -hmm. But once numerical taxonomy came along, there was a way that you could repeat it. You could say, okay, um, you don't like that arrangement. You think that the fishes actually are more closely related to birds than to mammals. Uh, you know, go ahead, do the measurements, test it out. And it showed me, and of course, Michener and others, but it showed me something that was very important, namely something that I believed in my science. Absolutely. I was absolutely convinced that Sokol was wrong. Mm -hmm. He showed me absolutely no, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's the last time I ever held a scientific view that I thought could not be changed by more data, a better theory, and so on. It was a, a very important thing in my life to show how wrong I'd been. Never uh, been wrong since, but what the yeah. <laughs> once in a lifetime. <laughs> Well, I think it's like he, he inducted you into the true scientific attitude towards things. And, uh, you know, as you say, a lot of scientists probably don't have that attitude. But, but the scientific attitude is supposed to be that you're open to every piece of information in another theory and whatever makes most sense, you go with that. So, well, that's why you're normally required to send your paper to a journal. You expect it to go out to a whole bunch of scientists to review it to make sure you, and by the way, on several occasions, I've had sent papers in, particularly one time, uh, where it went to 20 different uh, reviewers, 19 of whom said it was brilliant, and one of whom said it was wrong, mm -hmm. and he was correct. Mm -hmm. uh, I had, uh, Actually, the statistician I was working with had made a very fundamental error, but a very subtle one, mm -hmm. and I was too stupid to pick it up. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm going to tie this into something else in another part of your book. Um, you mentioned that chimpanzees and humans have uh, DNA that's 96% similar. Um, and, and so uh, how can you put those into two different species? But you also mentioned, that, and I know it's a very commonly sort of pop uh, science idea out there, that, that our DNA is very similar to chimpanzees' DNA. But you make the point that, that it's how the DNA and different parts of it are turned on and off. Um, that make the big difference, not, not that the DNA itself is the same uh, or so similar. And maybe I thought you could explain a little bit about that turning on and off, because I think that's not so well known um, well, in the Well, there are ways that the genome, that is the set of DNA messages, there's about, I can't remember because it's not my area specifically, mm -hmm. but something on the order of 26,000 genes uh, in, our, uh, in our genome. And that's nowhere near enough to program all the things that genetics does. And it's because there are a whole series of mechanisms that modify which gene is on, uh, how much it's producing of its product and so on. And that's where a lot of the subtlety comes in. And those things are more closely tied to the environment uh, than, the, uh, than the standard DNA, which uh, those changes come along much more slowly. Mm -hmm. So that, for example, when we looked at the issue, when <clears throat> my colleague Sandra Kahn, Dr. Kahn, pointed out to me, uh, we were we had met. She's an orthodontist. We had met through common. Mm -hmm. Our families had met through common conservation interests, and she pointed out that human jaws were shrinking, and I was really embarrassed because it hadn't dawned on me. I knew that. Most kids had their mouths full of metal, but had never asked the question of why in hell would human jaws be shrinking? And it turned out dentists thought that that was changes in the DNA. 
Mm. But the shrinkage was so fast and so recent, it couldn't possibly have been changes in the DNA. Could have been changes in the way the environment affected the DNA, but you had to figure out how the environment was involved. That's the way I got into an area of science, which to me was very rewarding because battling to solve the environmental problems rarely helped individuals. In other words, Mm -hmm. if I convinced uh, people that they had to do something about the rate that the climate is being disrupted, it didn't help individuals. But when Sandra and I wrote a book about how to deal with your shrinking jaw and your so-called wisdom teeth and Mm -hmm. so on, that's something that could help individuals. So I found it much more pleasurable. Uh, We're still working. Uh, Our book, Jaws, is doing very well, and we're working on a book on the nose which has similar problems. It's amazing uh, how, again, the medical community is so siloed that people who work on teeth often don't work on the jaws, and the people who work on the jaws don't work on the nose, even though the upper jaw is the base of the nose and they're Mm. intimately connected. Um, So having a lot of fun in a very different area, which one of the things I hope to show in the book is that it's a lot more fun not to be siloed, Mm -hmm. that you can uh, switch around and ask different questions and bring the techniques of different sciences and the humanities Mm -hmm. uh, and the arts into, for instance, uh, on the question of sustainability of civilization, the humanities and arts are much more important now than the science, Mm -hmm. uh, but people don't realize it. How did I get on uh, this that is, harangue? This is just an aside, but uh, how did you and Sandra split the royalties from the movie rights for Jaws? <laughs> All right. She gets... <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, have, we have a lot of uh, questions coming in from the audience, and there's so much more to talk about, but I am going to... Uh, we'll go to the, some questions from the audience first and see if we can cover those, and then we'll, we'll go on. And anybody else who would like to ask questions... Of Paul, just to put it in the uh, YouTube chat. So, um, who have been your scientific heroes role models? My scientific my heroes, I think maybe number one was Steve Schneider, mm-hmm. uh, who in some ways I pushed towards being a hero, but uh, he spent his life trying to, uh, first of all, doing world-class research on the climate And then second, trying to explain it uh, to uh, the general public and politicians and so on. Mm. He died tragically of uh, of lymphoma. It was typical of Steve that he wrote about his treatment. Um, He has a book, had a book called Patient from Hell, because as a scientist, uh, he got to understand the lymphoma, work very closely with some excellent oncologists at Stanford, at Mm -hmm. Stanford's medical school, and not only helped his own treatment, but helped future people's treatment by the things he he said about how the system worked. Uh, So Steve was one of my heroes. Don Kennedy, who was president of Stanford and a close friend, and uh, unfortunately died of COVID, was one of my heroes. Michener, and Sokol, my two mentors, uh, were certainly heroes. Uh, and of course, Charles Darwin, because uh, <laughs> one of the greatest pleasures I've had in my life is occasionally uh, right wing idiots uh, writing on the worst books ever written um, will say um, uh, the uh, Marxist capital but they almost always include Darwin. Mm -hmm. And when they include the population bomb with the origin of species, I, first of all, can know how idiotic they are (laughs) because there's no comparison. And B, it makes me very proud. Yeah, it should. Uh, (laughs) I mean, one of the nicest things that happened uh, to me, uh, I did a a, uh, video on 60 Minutes and Elon Musk attacked me and the population bomb. You know, I could have just kissed him. I mean, <laughs> when, when, when the biggest idiot on the planet attacks you, 
nothing is better you know it was just <laughs> wonderful <laughs> Well, I liked your joke in the book when you said that uh, two of your heroes are Rachel Carson and Johnny Carson. That was a, another, and and and, Johnny, and it was it was it's serious as well as a joke. I thought it was a very good comedy. Oh, John was wonderful to work with, just yeah. wonderful. Now, here's another question from uh, one of our listeners: You've traveled the world for your research. Do you have a favorite place or places that you wish you could have visited? You have you didn't get to, or did you get everywhere? Um, I've done pretty well at getting everywhere, but the um, the place that I would like there are two places I would like to have been able to spend more time doing research uh, and also getting to know people uh, one is West Africa where um, things getting around and so on is very very tough and uh, I usually got around by lecturing on cruise ships I did have a cruise Anne and I were going to lecture on a cruise ship going down the West African coast but uh, the friends we had, many by that time, because I'd done so much lecturing, um, said, You'll, your passengers will hate it because the customs and so on are so miserable. Mm -hmm. So I called up the company and said, you know, I hate to do this, but I'm going to back out of that cruise. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, don't hate it because we've learned the same things and we're backing out too. Mm -hmm. And the other is Central Asia because the butterflies I was most interested in are extremely interesting in Central Asia. Uh, and uh, I, my bucket list once included taking the train across, but with things, you know, we canceled our, our coming vacation uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, and mm -hmm. then we canceled it in Turkey. And I think we're not going to go to uh, uh, across through Russia these days. It just doesn't seem wise. Yeah. All right. Um, but uh, but uh, the questioner was absolutely right. You have traveled all over the world, and you mentioned the cruise ships uh, that that uh, early on, uh, because of your uh, fame as a as a spokesman for science, you got to lecture on all these cruise ships, and then you you got to travel the world with Anne uh, at a reasonable cost. Yeah, you know, very well. Uh, Stanford. Yeah. One other nice thing about Stanford is they have an excellent travel study program where they get faculty uh, to go along and lecture on serious stuff uh, to Stanford alumni who mm. get on the trips. Mm. And the trips are uh, expensive, except for the lecturers. So uh, that was a wonderful way to get around the world. The other thing was that when we went to Australia on sabbatical in 1965, we didn't want to fly. We wanted to, we'd never been on a ship, mm -hmm. a big ship, and we had to take a lot of equipment with us. And so we decided the price was about the same to go on the Mariposa uh, Matson Line cruise ship in a tiny indoor cabin um, and, uh, and fly. So we went by ship, but by pure luck, mm -hmm. I got to know the purser who was interested in, among other things, reef fishes and introduced me to them in Bora Bora, mm -hmm. and we became fast friends. And he lived in San Francisco. And when we were in Australia, every time the ship came through Australia, we had him up for dinner. And then we continued our social life in San Francisco. And a couple of years later, I said to him, you know, we had such a great time in Australia, I'd give a right arm to be able to go back. And he said, listen, if you're willing to give a couple lectures a week, we'll take you anytime you want in, anytime you want to go. Mm, great. And he got me into cruise lecturing and Stanford the same. So it was a wonderful, uh, the best thing probably I got out of Stanford in total was to be able to be in the, uh, from the point of view of my research and getting to know the world uh, was the Stanford Travel Study Program. And you, you, you mentioned the name of the book is Mariposa. You want to explain why that's interesting to the... Yes, well, Mariposa is Spanish for butterfly. <laughs> I've spent my life because it's too expensive to get students to Africa to work in tropical forests. I've spent a lot of my life uh, in uh, tropical forests in uh, the Western Hemisphere. And of course, I think it's impolite for people to work long term in a country without trying to learn the language. So one of I've done is tried to learn Spanish and proven 
that you can't really learn a language unless you start when you're very, very young. But <laughs> it's ironic, but I've my three closest research colleagues today are all Mexican. Hmm. Lo siento. All right, here's a big question. Um, do you have advice to deal with science deniers or, or people who oppose your scientific views? You mean outside of execution? <laughs> 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 Look, pe people are smart. And if you say, the only thing you say to them is there's lots of sources of information. It's not hard to learn what the BS sites are and so on. Trust yourself. Listen, I mean, uh, you know, people say, oh, it's not the standard line is population is a problem. It's just there's too much consumption. Hmm. And it's like saying, you know, the area of a rectangle is important, but it's determined entirely by its width, not by its length. Of course, the amount of consumption, obviously, to anybody mm -hmm. is a product of how many people there are and on average how much they consume. And if you want to solve the problem of too much consumption, you can reduce the amount of cons the amount people consume or you can reduce the number of people consuming, uh, and either one will lower the total amount of consumption. And if you can't understand that, then probably the best thing to do is go back to the first grade and say, teacher, you didn't teach me enough about arithmetic. Yeah. So I have a big question here about the population issue um, from some of the stuff that's in your book um, and other things that I've, I've read about this. You mentioned that you did some studies where the amount of biomass that has been uh, a just plant biomass that's been adjusted to human consumption is the, about 40 percent and and uh, the the what i've read which may be completely off um, is that the human biomass our eight billion bodies uh, amounts to one ten thousandth of one percent of the overall biomass um, I, I can't testify for the last number because I don't carry them all in my head. Yeah. But the human biomass and the biomass of our um, companions, our sheep and our particularly our beef and so on, right. is a huge chunk of the biomass. But that study was done because Ann and I wanted to know the answer, but we didn't know how to go about it. But mm. that was one of the other great advantages of being at Stanford. That is two of the most brilliant scientists dealing with issues in that area and mm. environmental issues in general uh, are both faculty members or both faculty members in our department, Peter Vitusik and his wife, Pamela Matson, uh, and both members of the National Academy. And we took the problem to them because it was in their bailiwick. I said, we'd like to do this, but we would need your help to do it, you actually would have to take the lead because you know how to do NPP calculate, net primary productivity calculations, and so on. It would take us till hell froze over to mm. dig up those numbers and do it. And so Peter and Pam uh, did it. And we worked together and produced a paper that uh, came up with a number of roughly 40% of the total uh, that's produced on the planet is co-opted or used by human beings. Yeah. And there are similar numbers, but one of the things that every study shows that most all of our environmental problems are about half caused by our overpopulation mm -hmm. and about half caused by the other factors. And um, the, uh, the numbers, of course, are getting worse and worse because of the rate of the loss of biodiversity, which today is along totally, completely tied in with uh, with climate disruption uh, and other things, uh, but getting worse and worse at a rate which is now thousands of times higher than the background rate. So those numbers are quickly becoming obsolete, I'm mm -hmm. afraid. Uh, people who want to know more about this can go to the web um, and look up ecological footprint, uh, mm -hmm. and there's good data there. Good. Well, I, we, we're, we're getting closer to the end of our hour, but uh, I have two really big questions for you. One is a, a sort of a conflicting set of your priorities uh, that conflict with each other. 
So there are people who say that we need to, what we need to do is we need to kind of get rid of all of the large mammals. In order that you have to decrease the population, you don't have to decrease the human population. If you decrease all of the large mammals, um, then they don't use up that, but that would make the rest of us have to be nearly vegetarian. Um, and I know that you enjoy eating meat so uh, from, from the stories that you told. And so I was wondering what you think about that idea, whether that's a viable, you know, it's sort of what, what was said in the 60s too by a lot of people. If we, if we became more vegetarian, we'd have a better chance. Well, the answer is yes, if we became more vegetarian uh, in the 60s, we might have had a better chance. It, by itself, it wouldn't have done the job. Yeah. It would have affected the climate disruption. Uh, it would have been positive there, but it depends on how you do it, what happens to the vegetation. It's a very complex issue. And the answer is most of the things that are now proposed, like electric cars mm -hmm. and so on, are not solutions. They're just nonsensical stuff around the edges. In other words, the problem is that the Chinese may try and pave the entire world for cars, mm -hmm. but we have to stop using cars for personal transportation mm -hmm. while we humanely keep the population shrinking mm -hmm. till we get to somewhere that recent studies show might be sustainable. The most unconservative such study that I know of was done by Sir Partha Dasgupta, the world's best economist, for the British government with hundreds of people working with him and a 600 page report. And he says, if everybody were willing to live at basically somewhat around the Mexican standard of living, that is the mm -hmm. level of consumption, you might be able to support 3.2 billion people. Right. We now have 8 billion. And that's the most conservative estimate I know of what might be supported if we were all willing to live at the consumption standard of the average Mexican. Now, if you want to live at the consumption standard of the average American, you need about four or five more planet Earths, yeah. which I'm sure Elon Musk will construct for us soon. Yeah, very, very soon. Yeah. So then the final question is, I mean, you're a very humane man from everything that you've done and all that. So your, your, your solution to this is not to knock off 5 billion people. It, it's, it, but do you have a way that you think is sustainable to say, slow down the growth, stop the growth? And I mean, we, we're, we're watching a few populations start to shrink uh, because the baby boom is starting to fall off the end. Is there a, a path forward that has been presented that says in 150 years, we can get back to 2 billion? There's a path without forward. killing people. No, without. We I mean, know exactly. First of all, it's my ethical position that once you have people on the planet, you do everything to give them a reasonable and and well life of well-being. And we have a start for the path that everybody could use, but they're not going to, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. And that is to give absolutely full rights and opportunities to women. Mm -hmm. We know from lots of situations that that's the way to bring the birth rate down. Get people caring about what happens to the children after they're born and give women full rights and opportunities and see what happens then. And that's the place to start. And unfortunately, we're moving in the wrong direction. Misogyny is still worldwide. Women don't get the breaks they should in any country, including the United States. Mm -hmm. And that's where we ought to move as a small group animal trying to live in big groups, we should go to giving women power and um, we don't do it. So that's the that's the place to start. If you want to get involved, get into uh, giving women full rights and full opportunities. Yeah, that's brilliant. You know, bottom line. You also talk about something that we're, we're, we're done essentially, but you, have, you talk about something that I think is really important to add to you talk about something you call growth mania that everybody's always talking about, we have to grow. But you know, if people just re uh, created a different goal for our economy, which was a certain quality of life for uh, the average person and not have it uh, so widely dis uh, in inequitably distributed, that with that kind growth. of a goal, you would have a different, uh, you know, also production. Exactly, growth yeah. is a disease, not the cure. Yeah. As long as you hear politicians saying, we gotta keep growing, then you know we're going down the drain.
<laughs> now, well, it, it's, it's a, when it, whenever you're, it's also easy, I mean, it's, it's a little human, unfortunately, because when you're, an institution is growing and growing quickly, all kinds of problems can be hidden. And therefore, you know, it's, it's popular with in, uh, incompetent leaders because it's easy to hide things. And unfortunately, that's probably more than half the, the uh, leaders, so. But it's the, it's the right principle for making it work. Um, and I couldn't agree more. It's been yeah. a pleasure talking to you. It's a pleasure talking to you too, Paul. And uh, I'm sure lots of other people are picking up uh, where, where all the work that you did and it'll, it'll be talked about. And I'm sure some of your, sounds like from, from how brilliant they are, some of your own descendants are gonna be carrying on your mantle for you too. Well, thank you very much for joining us at the Commonwealth Club. And so ends My another event. Pleasure. Uh, in our 120th year of enlightened discussion, we hope you come back to see some others. Thanks a lot, Paul. Really appreciate it. My pleasure.